Welcome to Expedition Self on Ohm Times Radio with lifelong learner, entrepreneur, and creator of the worlds of Expedition Self, Sam Parado. Sam shares four decades of studying, guiding, and teaching how to go inside so we can build an incredibly powerful, dynamic, and validating relationship with the self. Expedition Self is laced with stellar, unexpected insights about what it means to be human. Listen now and ignite your self-development process with Sam Parado. Well, hello, I am Sam Parado in the flesh. And, um, you know, it's such a treat to get to talk each week about going inside. It's my favorite subject. And, you know, to me, there's really nothing more important in life than our self-development process because, you know, we're here to grow and evolve. And unless we learn the art of going inside, then the the process, it just won't generate all of the results that it could actually yield for us. So each week, uh, if you're new to the show, I choose a topic and then walk you through building brick by brick, going deeper brick by brick, I guess I'd say, I show you how to go inside with that topic and how to work with it and how to relate to it from the inside out. So uh, if you'd like to follow along with the shows, you can go to samparado.com and get connected with me, and then you'll know kind of what's coming each week. Also, uh, this is a call-in show, and it's always more fun when you call in. So I'm hoping today's topic will ignite you and uh, enlighten you, and you'll want to like share a little bit at 202-570-7057. So that's the number you'll want to call in if you'd like. All right. So this week's topic is about transitions and change. Gosh, I could probably do five shows on this. It's such a huge topic, right? You know, I hear people a lot say, oh, I like change or I don't like change. I pretty much think that there are parts of us that do and parts of us that don't, right? For all of us. But the part that doesn't is the unconscious closed system of our wiring. And it's not that it doesn't really like change. It's that the existence of this closed system has it by its functionality be resistant to change because its job is to hold itself together. (laughs) That's kind of funny, right? Like that something exists to hold itself together. And so of course, change would be a threat to that. And I'm saying that closed system is us. So you throw in that by the very nature of being alive, we have to transition in and out of all kinds of moments and events and situations and circumstances as we intentionally march and gently slide through our days and our nights. So when you think of a transition in your life, what comes to mind? Changing from one school to another, moving out of your house, completing the time when your children were at home before they go off, you know, to do life on their own, changing jobs, maturing, aging from from one decade to another, um, seeing life through a new lens as your body changes, maybe before marriage and after marriage, or maybe even inside of working on a big project and it actually getting done or being completed. You know, there's so many transitions we go through and they all require some change. So in some ways, change is forced upon us. We live and we we then change. But what results from it are these transitions that I'm referring to. They're these natural evolutionary shifts that come from going and living through and embodying your life. Okay, so this is a good time to grab something to write with and start to jot down all of the transitions that come to your mind and start floating in. You know, I really think each week when I talk that the idea is your unconscious is going to start to deliver you some new information. So you want to have that pen ready so that you can jot it down as it shows up. So this is your lifetime. These are the checkpoints and the rest areas and the open roadways that mark the journey you have driven and are driving. So I like to think of transitions in the context of traveling in the natural world, like by car, or by bicycle, skateboard, or boat. You know, what would you imagine is your vehicle of choice? Makes it a little more fun, right? And while you move, while you're traveling, weather comes, you meet hills and flatlands, you stop for food and gas and sleep, 
and you deal with other voyagers, and much of it is unknown. But if you think of transitions as going from one landscape to another, or from one pace or another, it allows you to realize that through life, the more you can step up and towards the next change in scenery, the more your inside self will be able to maximize in the experience that comes out of it. So this is kind of tricky though, right? Because if you start thinking of the mountain up ahead and miss out on the here and now, right? Goals, got to get somewhere, got to make something happen. Then you diminish what's possible to glean while you're actually on the road in this place. And this is a big part of what I think we have to learn how to do. You know, let's, let's, let's stick with this tourist adventure thing. The minute you see the mountain up ahead, you're going to feel something. And even though you may be someone who loves going from the grasslands to the mountains, you'll feel something about that change that you see coming. So what's interesting here is I think some people want to see the change so they become emotionally ready for it. And some people, they don't want to see the change until it's upon them because it creates anxiety or stress. Which one are you? So what makes a transition really powerful is when we are able to be emotionally ready. So the more we are emotionally up for any transition or change, the more we'll be able to fully experience it in the here and now. But this is a really complicated thing to accomplish because emotional readiness means that you've gotten comfortable really holistically choosing what's happening. You've placed the power of who you are behind it and you accept what's coming. You work it out in your head. It makes sense. And your fears or your trepidations are they're acknowledged and they're validated so that there's a lot of support for the inside of you. But that's not the only part of being truly ready for it. Of course, that was a lot. <laughs> it's funny. I said all that and then I think well, only, oh my gosh, there's so much going on there. Because you also have to be willing to embrace anything that comes up from the past as it comes. So I think a lot of times when we imagine we're going to go forward, we think, okay, the past is behind me. What, I, what I'm actually saying is that part of dealing with transitions and moving across that, that, that roadway is inviting the past to show up as you're moving towards the future. This is one of those things that I think the self-actualization conversation out there doesn't spend enough time on. You know, it's like, get going and don't think about anything that drags you backwards. Be forward moving. Don't let those thoughts get in your way. And, and in actuality, it, it lessens the ability to bring the whole self along for the ride. So while we're moving across the terrain, we, we might relate to it as a garden, right? But that completely short circuits the being with your whole self if you don't. And the, the very idea that with each step when we move forward brings us more present to a step from behind. I'm hoping that that makes some sense, that you really can't move forward wholly and completely without something from the past, some experience, some leftover something, right, that wants to kind of come with you or be, be known and be connected with. You cannot move towards that mountain without bringing up an equally powerful moment of transition or change from your past. You could think of it like um, three miles ahead means you'll connect with three miles behind. But what most do is try to ignore it or stuff it into a little hidey hole in the motor home. So the perception is that it won't slow them down. But it does. It slows you down at an unconscious level. And this is what we're really trying to bring up when we're going inside the self is we're trying to open up all this, what I consider 95% of the unconscious self that you are housed in and getting it up and out so you can have access to it and get the momentum that comes from it. So remember when I said that to me going inside is everything? Well, that's the thing with moving through life. It means that Whenever a past experience shows up to work with, while you're moving forward, you invite, you welcome, and you engage with it. So remember I said it's kind of like you want to, you're moving across the desert, uh, but you're also wanting to relate to it like a garden. I actually found a poem 
that says this. Life is a garden, not a road. We enter and exit through the same gate, wandering. Where we go matters less than what we notice. That was written by, I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, but Bokanon. And so I thought, isn't it interesting that that's what we're managing as we work with transitions is the forward movement, but also the staying in one place and noticing, right? So it's challenging to be truly ready for the change from the countryside to the ocean side. I am having (laughs) a lot of fun with all these references to the land. You know, um, I think I might have spoken about this on another show, but when I was a little girl, I traveled all over the United States with my grandmother. I think we started our first travel when I was five, and I think our last big trip was when I was 14. We started out in a station wagon, and then we drove in a quarry cruiser, which is like a glorified van, and it always had engine problems. Um, And then ultimately, we ended up in a motorhome, which was super cool. One time, we spent two days in North Dakota because the engine started smoking as we crossed the Badlands. And on the Cory Cruiser, the engine was actually in between the two of our front seats. I don't know about that design. Even then, I thought, oh, that's not the most great place. It made it really hot. And it was hot. (laughs) So, you know, I think about these travel experiences and how they had me get comfortable with the changes of scenery and weather. And, you know, we would just stay on the roads for a long, long time. And eventually we would experience everything, flat, hilly, mountainous, rainy, icy, uh, sunny, right? Uh, Tornadoes. (laughs) You know, one of the ways my grandmother and I used to be ready for the next transition, right, which meant the next journey or the next leg of the trip was by stopping along the way and digging these rocks. It had this incredibly grounding quality to it. You know, our fingers were in the ground and we would spend hours with gloves on our hands and picks at the ready. And our entire attention was focused on the plot of land that we had chosen, you know, for the exploration. So this idea about how we can help ourselves be emotionally ready has to do with pausing and taking in and working with our bodies. You know, we really do function out of our heads. It's our default place. We try to think our way through feelings. We try to think our way through avoiding too much sensory input. So I'm drawing a parallel between my rock digging in the earth and being in touch with your body. It's so easy to believe that if you think it, then it's done. But it's not because the body, it has its own language, its own pace, its own cellular memory. And we have a tendency to work our bodies, but not truly, truly listen to them. You know, sometimes the body just isn't ready to move on. Sometimes it tells you this by being lethargic or energy less, but you push it anyway because you're trying to get somewhere. And sometimes it knows that there's something from the past that needs attention and wants to be worked with, but you ignore it. Because you see, the body at a cellular level remembers every single moment that it's actually functioned as your body. I've actually, I've tested this theory bunches of times and I'm even right now moving through something that my body starts to feel sluggish. And if I stop and I really look for what's coming up, either about where I'm moving or where I've come from, right, transition, I get information. Sometimes some emotion shows up and when I'm done, it's very interesting. My, my, my body actually feels ready to be energetic again and to move towards that next change or the next destination. I think about even the transition from winter to spring, you know, when people will say, I don't know that I'm quite ready to come out, right? But in order to connect to your body, you actually have to ask, body, why are you tired? (laughs) I have a hip that's not working very well. And boy, have we had some interesting conversation about what my body is trying to tell me. So this being emotionally ready, it's complicated Because sometimes it doesn't look like something that we would actually choose. So let's take a typical moment in life, like being asked to leave a job or finding yourself divorced when it wasn't at all what you wanted. You know, these transitions take a lot more to be able to be emotionally in sync with because there are actually parts of you that really didn't want what happened, that have pain about it. 
And, and if you go in here, it's going to lead to a very hefty dose of going inside and looking for the truths that led to the change. So right now, before I talk a little bit more about these transitions or changes that we don't actually want and how do we work through those so that we can stay emotionally in sync with the actual flow and rhythm um, of our pathway, I just want to ask you a couple questions about your own world is if you think quickly, which transitions, which changes in your life do you still find yourself caught in? Like they still take you back there. You still find yourself talking about them. There's something about them that doesn't feel complete. And I'd really love to hear from you. I'd love to hear you share those and, and maybe even like how you work through it or what you saw. All right. The number you can call is 202 Five seven zero seven zero five seven, and um, when I come back, we'll talk more about these transitions and changes that we don't choose. A conscious lifestyle for a mindful life. Om Times Radio, I O M F M. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Connect at ohmtimes.com. Ohm Times, creating a more conscious lifestyle. <music> My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. Coping 19, brought to you by CDC and the Ad Council. If you're feeling increasingly lonely right now, you're not alone. It's totally normal. Even though we may not be able to get together in person, connecting virtually with friends and family still gives you a chance to interact with people and may help raise your spirits. Join a virtual book club, set up group text chats, or online video coffee breaks with coworkers. Find more self-care and coping tips at coping-19.org. Well, welcome back. I'm Sam Parado. You're listening to Expedition Self. And our topic today is all about transitions and change. And before we went out on break, um, we were talking about how to stay emotionally ready for transitions so that while you're driving through your life, you're able to actually show up for it. And I really, I wanted to focus in a little bit on about some of the changes that go on in our life that we don't really choose, that we re don't really want what's actually happening. And you know, a lot of times I talk to people who leave marriages unwillingly, and they have a really tough time acknowledging what their truth was. It just feels like something was done to them. And it was unfair and unjust. So I'd ask some questions like, were you really emotionally engaged in that marriage? Did you bring a vulnerable truth to it? How much of yourself did you hold back to keep the peace or to keep the status quo? Or what did you overlook or let pass that actually mattered to you? And why did you stay in the marriage? And where was the growth and change in that marriage? Because you see, relationships have transitions and change too. But we can, we can, we can miss the mountain off in the distance if we're just trying to get it right or keep it going. And before we know it, that mountain has arrived with a storm and we're completely unprepared because we didn't realize that we weren't really settling into the real and true, the what's so when we were on those foothills driving up. I'm hoping this, this metaphor is working. See, when I talk about being really in the here and now and being willing to listen to the inside about where you're going and what's happened in the past, a lot of relationship dynamics are based on leaving the past or the difficult or the unresolved or the unsaids behind. 
And the more that happens, then the more the relationship just isn't set up for being emotionally in touch and ready for the next change and able to handle that next change. It's kind of like you're driving around in circles thinking this is what will keep you out of the mountains. But it really doesn't work that way because we're supposed to be evolving all the time. And life helps us to do that by creating this changing landscape that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm hoping this is kind of making sense. We're saying that transitions and change are actually running at a pace all of the time. But we actually are fighting it. We're resisting it. We're unconscious to it. We don't even realize what we're what we're taking on that we don't clear out to be ready for it. And the more we can actually do that, the more we're going to feel the benefits of showing up for ourselves. So you can apply this to a job too. Think about going to a job, getting burnt out, not really liking the person you're working for, keeping it because you need the job, not believing there's another opportunity for you, or keeping it because it's good money or it's giving you benefits. See, this is, this is the same thing I was talking about in that marriage. We're not really allowing for the truth, the realness, and the need for change to happen in that job. And before we know it, a transition is thrust upon us that we didn't think we chose. But I'm saying to be emotionally ready for transitions, we have to find where we were making choices inside of that. In the job, when we make the choice to just do it the same way over and over and over, even though we're bored, or we interact with our coworkers in such a way, even though we're not really happy with it, and we don't talk about, hey, this isn't really making me happy. That's the place where we're not really dropping in. And so inevitably, some change is going to make its way to us. Because at the end of the day, our development as a human being is actually at work all the time, whether we're conscious to it or not. So choices to ignore what our body is telling us, choices to overlook and avoid conversation about our feelings and our thoughts and our needs, right? And when we do that, we're unprepared for the changes and the transitions because we just aren't driving intentionally. So when we think about mm, hauling ass across the prairie <laughs> and making our way to the Rockies, I'm coming from the East, there's this pace and intention and attention you have to bring to the actual drive. You're collecting parts of yourself the whole way and inviting the changes in the landscape and the sun coming up and going down and really getting in sync with it. With it. Excuse me. But for many of us, we just try to do the same thing each day and not rock the boat so we don't have to feel insecure or disruptive or deal with like not knowing, right? We're, we're working to get along. But this is equivalent to like never stopping for gas or food, like hot fudge sundaes, which are my favorites, or patty melts, or sleep, or stopping along the way to see what that little town has to offer in terms of nature, you know, the waterfalls, or the people, or art, or some festival. It's the same as driving around the roads, the same roads over and over. So I'm saying that to be really ready for emotional transitions, we have to make sure that we're taking care of our need for more than the mundane or the routine. And part of that is discovering and exploring and investigating wherever we are, wherever we are in ourselves, whatever we're thinking and feeling with a desire to enrich ourselves, to actually connect more deeply with ourselves and reveal mysteries about what we're thinking or feeling that we don't know, and to appreciate the stop, even if it's brought on by a tornado watch. Okay, so here's, I put this in bold for myself because I really wanted to capture it for you. So being emotionally ready for the next transition has to do with, one, choosing with your whole self, two, listening to your body, three, inviting the past into the present as you move towards the future, looking for, I think I'm at four, looking at how you have ignored or overlooked your aliveness and intimacy to this moment. And five, my duffers are right here, making sure that you are doing more than just being caught up in the routine. That's how we get emotionally ready for transitions.
So there's one last element I want to bring out here in terms of being emotionally ready. And it has to do with not wanting to notice that you are in fact moving somewhere. Sometimes this looks like being content with where you are. And sometimes it has to do with not wanting things to, t to change or like being attached or holding on. You know, a long time ago, in my early 30s, I moved into this house that was like my dream house. You know, it sat on a hill and it had big high ceilings. And I was the first one to get to the house before the movers or anyone else on that day. And I walked in the door and I looked around and I could feel it. And I walked over to a corner in the den of the front of the house and I pushed myself against the wall and then sank down into my knees placing my bottom on the floor. From there, I could see everything. And as I said out loud, I'm never leaving this house. I have all that I want. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about the acquisition part of this. I'm talking about the emotional sense of comfort and security of having what I wanted and needed and then wanting to hold on with everything I had so that it never changed. And this would be like being on that drive and deciding never to drive through the mountains because I wanted to stay on the lake. This just isn't how life goes. <laughs> you know, your life is a highway, you know, life is a highway, you know, that song. <laughs> and because of this, even if you don't want anything to change, it absolutely must do so. So there it is. How do you get in sync, in rhythm with these changes that are inevitable? So one is all that I've talked about being emotionally ready. But then there's this ability to see your life as the highway. And I don't think we spend en enough time really doing this. How do you go back over your lifetime and all of the transitions you've lived through and look at them for the same elements I talked about earlier? Were you emotionally ready? Can you see your choices? Is there an understanding where you did or didn't listen to your body? Is there the getting caught in the mundane? Did you ignore the enriching part of the experience? And did you welcome the past into the present? That last one, a lot of times when we don't do that, welcome the past into the present, it gets us later. And we can't even figure out what happened or why we feel sluggish. Right? So it's important. So sometimes we have to heal these past transitions because some discomfort or suffering or pain, you know, was attached to it. It's like the fifth move for a child, the family divorce, the loss of a job because of health, the birth of a child that was difficult, the loss of a family member, or the change in your lifestyle in some way, uh, you know, because of socioeconomic reasons. See, every change of your life likely has some pain attached to it, even if it was a change that just had you miss people you loved. That was a change that you initiated and wanted and couldn't wait to experience. So if you want to be really ready and open for that next passage of life, then you'll want to go back and look at all these transitions and notice each of these ways to slice it up and look and be with it. We have some experiences of past transitions and changes, and it's likely we didn't talk or feel enough about them. And they're embedded inside of this unconscious I always talk about, and they produce resistance to moving and sink and forward with life's rhythm. And that resistance takes the form of things not working the way they should, or us not really getting ourselves motivated to put the pieces in place to make a change, right? That resistance is a super important part of our noticing ourselves. You see, our transitions are worthy of your reverence and your gratitude and your attention and your heart. They're the, they're the basis for you to feel like a warrior who has, has lived a life, sometimes getting all the power that comes from knowing you chose it and sometimes having to find that choice through the processing of it. What? I got to slow down here. Because um, this part I really feel so strongly about is because we, we don't honor our path enough. What we know is that without choice being present, without you finding choice, you're less ready for the next transition or change. 
because it comes weight becomes like weightier and maybe scarier and less interesting. We become tired because we're carrying incomplete transitions on our shoulders from before. So I have another poem for you right here by David Wagner. It's called Lost. All right, ready? Here it goes. Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here. And you must treat it as a powerful stranger. You must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen. Listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again saying, here, no two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. Is that like not the most perfect poem for this conversation? So finding choice in transitions you didn't choose starts with being grateful for the transition itself. What growth came from it? What did it ask of you? Why is this a perfect learning experience for you as you look at your soul's journey? Most of us think, why would I find the value in this thing that felt bad or hurtful? And I would say, what value to you as a person came from it. And beyond that, we have a tendency to get caught up in social appropriateness in so many situations. So we don't speak our truth because we're trying to follow the company or family line. So a lot of times these moments when a transition happens that we don't think we would choose, what we actually see is that it teaches us about being more real and authentic and how much we don't really want to be vulnerable. We don't want people to see us in any other light, right, than one that's together and getting somewhere. So looking for choice, even when we didn't consciously choose it, it's one of the most powerful self-development tools you can make use of. And the more you find it inside of your life, the more ready you are to go forward. So this is the thing. Are you going forward intentionally? How are you embracing the transitions in your life? And do you make room for the past as you try to embark upon the future? This is an awesome time to call in. I'd love to hear the answers to those questions. How are you embracing the transitions in your life? So, you know, I like this word. It's the word causing because it's this intention to cause yourself to be emotionally in sync with the transitions in your life that makes all the difference. So what is this? Well, it's like um, it's a mental intention to apply or bring energy to everything I just talked about. And it's a super powerful concept because it doesn't have you override anything or invalidate anything, but it does have you get clear about being the source, the, the wellspring, the core, the engine of that car driving across the territory of your life. So the engine, you're the driver, but causing is the engine. And so this brings us to the point in the conversation where I ask, what, what really runs your engine? Right? What really, what really keeps you going, keeps you wanting to be intentional, keeps you wanting to look inside. Because when we're talking about transitions and change, there's a lot to see about what fuels your desire to be in sync with the changing landscape of your life. Are you afraid of the future? Are you afraid of death? Are you afraid of losing? or of being inadequate, or of not understanding, of feeling like you're, you're not able to think well, or of being at risk, or of dealing with the unknown? Are you afraid of feeling all of what you actually feel and what that means in your life? 
I know you could say, <laughs> how did we get from the engine to this? But truly, this is what has us want to cause our own progress or not. Remember when I talked about I'm going to lay bricks and I'm going to take you down deeper and deeper inside the self as we talk about transitions and change? Well, this is a layer under this idea of being emotionally ready. It's under the idea of choosing. It has to do with where your core energy really exists. See, cause, cause is the torque. It's the desire, the groundswell of the self to create, to make, to drive, and all of those things we don't want to feel. So let me go over these questions again. I'd love to hear from you when you call in after break, when I, after I go over these. Are you afraid of the future? Are you afraid of death, of losing, of being inadequate, of not understanding or thinking straight, of being at risk, of dealing with the unknown? Are you afraid of feeling all of what you feel? So call in at 202-570-7057 and be in the conversation with me. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Imagine yourself being transported to India to the banks of the Ganga and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Om Times Radio. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in, in my, my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, you're listening to Expedition Self, and I'm Sam Parado, and we're back talking about transitions and change. And here I was say, inviting people to call in, and I actually had a caller, and I didn't realize it, and she's been sitting there 10 minutes being so patient. So, Diane, I'm so glad to hear from you again. What have you got to say about transitions and change? Well, I think I should have hung up and actually listened to you on the radio rather than trying to figure out what I was going to say when you answered the phone. <laughs> but um, I, um, I, as I was, as you ask us to write down uh, our transitions in life and just make a list of them, I thought it was, I thought I thought it was well noted that all of a sudden I started out writing down things that I felt like I had no control over that um it just it just was to be i i couldn't talk about it when i did talk it didn't it didn't provide any change and so the ultimate decision for a particular thing was made uh i don't think i have gone back and revisited some of them um, but as I, this is where I felt like, oh, wow, this is a great exercise. I need to go back and listen to your program again, is that the more that I wrote, the less, the ones that I put down were the happy transitions. I started out with transitions that I, I actually was mad, felt like I had no choice, it felt like I couldn't change it if I wanted to. 
But as I kept on writing, I found that the things that uh, came to me were more joyful, were were, uh, items that I would do again. And Mm -hmm. so... I'm going to leave it at that, but I, I that's what I wanted to say, and I, I probably uh, stayed on the line for, for that reason, you know. Well, I'll tell you uh, what you're describing is something I think is so magical about when you really give yourself a chance to go inside is that it actually moves on its own. So you go from, like a lot of people are afraid about going inside because they think it's all going to be yucky. But what uh-huh. you just described really was, was quite beautiful because it's like you put it down, you stayed with it, you noticed it, and then something else showed up and right. you get to notice that too. So, oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that with all of us because you, it really you are welcome. that point home. And thank I will you. continue to listen. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Okay. So we uh, left with a bunch of questions um, that have to do with this idea of causing and which really is the desire to want to be intentional or want to work on how do you stay emotionally ready and in sync with all these transitions and change. So everything about going inside has to do with reflecting and contemplating your inner world. You can do it in the shower. You can do it with a journal. The, the key is, you know, to give your mind some place to go other than what am I going to do today? <laughs> what am I having for dinner? Oh, when am I picking my child up? So right now you are in some place. You are at the beginning, the middle, or the end of some track of land in your life. How would you describe it? Can you see into the distance? How do you settle more fully into where you are right now? And if you asked your body about where you are, what would it say? So what past moments are coming up for you? And what is happening in your engine when you think about what you're afraid of? This some place that you are, how are you taking time to enrich yourself and take in the scenery and the panorama that surrounds you. See, this is an important element in self-development, to have a sense of where you are in your process, in your life, with your dreams. Are you starting a new phase or are you getting ready to start one? Are you concluding a chunk of life that has been brought about by a family or job or a relationship change? Relationship change? Or are you healing from an event and replenishing and recharging? You see, too often, we don't stop and really think about where we are in the big trajectory of our life. And the reason this is important is because each of us are the where we are. We require different setups to support us depending on where we are. So let me just talk a little bit about this. If we're in a healing space, It's important that we make a lot of time, unscheduled, unplanned, unpressured, to allow for that healing to find its way into our days, into our mornings. We would say more no's to commitments. No, thank you. (laughs) We do only the must-have parts of life, and we make room to go to retreats or workshops that bring about a creative introspection. I'd suggest lots of letter writing to the self, lots of nature, lots of art and writing, and no pressure. Okay, so here's a different phase, right? If we're getting to getting ready, like to start a new phase, to open up new things, to to expand and cause new stuff in our life, generate new stuff, we'd likely be absorbing and consuming lots of new information. We might be talking to people more actively. We might be looking into more technology. We would need to create some new practices that would sustain our whole self when we get into full scale go mode can be a very busy time and it it would ask you to think about how do you really stay with the pace without sacrificing your energy level and sense of abundance and while you're inviting in more information and making room for the self to communicate with you. Here's another one. Perhaps you're nearing the end of a phase. So there's a lot of threads to tie off. There's 
a deep reflection about where you've been and what's occurred that you'll need to make space for. It's a time when you can feel frustrated or impatient about not being able to get started on the next thing. You know, maybe those threads that you need to tie off, you know, maybe they feel daunting and you'll need to support yourself for a while before you can get to them. And sometimes there are people to return to to get cleaned up with or to get complete with. You see, every place that you occupy in this vast trajectory of your life is in some way bringing about change and causing a transition. So, like, the more you can understand what's needed in a given phase of life, the more you're truly being with this journey that is only yours to occupy. And I love this word, cavort with. (laughs) So often, you know, we just get on that hamster wheel or roller coaster, and we don't get conscious about this place. I'm putting quotes around this word. And then we don't intentionally put what we need in place to support ourselves. So if we don't recognize where we are inside of these transitions, well, then we can't stop and think about what am I thinking about right now? Putting words to feelings, distinguishing your inner world with words, and it helps to validate and support and turn you towards yourself. See, by paying attention to you, You're actually providing a fulfilling feast that will fortify you as you move through and towards these transitions. So, you know, it's it's like the challenge in life is that we lose energy. We slowly but surely can become cynical and resign to do things that we feel depleted by. We become less alive if we don't take really good care of ourselves along the journey. And I don't, I think a lot of us don't. I think we just, we just don't spend the time. We may not know how, you know, life pushes us so hard. It doesn't dawn on us that there's thought that needs to be brought to ourselves in these transitions. You know, think of it as if you like set off from the East Coast to get to the West Coast, but you didn't rest, you didn't eat, and you didn't service the car. How far would you get? right? How much could you actually take in and enjoy and receive and like revel in at each stop if you didn't replenish and refuel and recharge along the way? These changes and transitions are often related to as something just to get through to the end goal or the next outcome. We muscle ourselves, we push ourselves around And rather than celebrating each important stop and experience and making sure we do a thorough job of going inside the self. See, we can do something different. We really can. We talked about causing ourselves into getting in sync with these transitions, to being ready for them, to making sure where our energy is, uh, to support like being intentional about it. But what would make us want to be more attentive, caring, and validating with ourselves? Because this is underneath all of the self-development experience, and it's underneath all the causing. So as you can see, if we started at the beginning of the hour, we're working down beneath and beneath and beneath. And now we're underneath causing. And it's a true desire to care for the self, for you to acknowledge, appreciate, and, and truly see who we are and what we're dealing with. So what comes under this is going to, I think it's going to shock you because I think it's a place most people never want to be. But from my experience, the desire to deeply care about the self, it starts with, drum roll here, feeling sorry for ourselves. I know, right? We're, we're told, stop feeling sorry for yourself and do something about what it is that you're feeling. It's seen as like a waste of time or an indulgence, maybe even actually selfish, But really, when we feel sorry for ourselves, we're feeling for ourselves. And that's where we want to have empathy and understanding, where we stop judging ourselves. You see, underneath all of the places where we want to get emotionally in sync with these changes that happen along the highway and in the gardens of our life, is the place where you have to decide. You have to decide that you deserve empathy and feeling. So what does feeling sorry for yourself sound like? Well, 
I'm going to tell you. You start with recognizing that things are hard. And they were hard. Even if in your head you think, no, it's no big deal. Living and being human is hard. So you acknowledge effort. Effort, both the effort that results in something and definitely the effort that resulted in nothing. You appreciate how brave you were, how much tenacity something took, how determined you were. And even when you decided to give up, you acknowledge that you felt things and that it takes something to feel things, right? You're going to acknowledge everything you see as a failure. You connect, you want to connect it with whatever it is you're feeling sorry for. You want to connect it to your unique and personal, specific to you, only you. You're the only one who walks in this. You're the only one who has this thumbprint journey. So maybe you struggled in some area and you never got, ever, ever got through it to make it different. Maybe you failed at something that was really important to you or you tried to make something work like a marriage or a job, but just couldn't figure out how to do it differently. When we feel sorry for ourselves, it's the place where you drop those oftentimes unrealistic expectations of what you should have done and look at what it really took to do what you did. Because standing up and getting up the next day after something doesn't go right, let me tell you, honey bunches, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. So here's how it goes. Change is happening all of the time, even if you don't acknowledge it. And this causes transitions that you may or may not see coming, and you may not like them when you go through them. Being emotionally ready has to do with choosing everything that comes your way, inviting the past into the present so it frees you up, making sure that you're doing more than the mundane, and being willing to cause yourself forward by finding your deeper truth and expressing your needs. Causing is supported by a willingness to so appreciate, celebrate, and feel sorry for what you've lived through. And being willing to look closely at where you are on the pathway, seeing where you are, the beginning, the middle, or the end of some physical, intellectual, or emotional shift or change. It provides more support for fully embracing and flourishing within your life. So I hope that you have a sense of wanting to go explore your transitions, wanting to find your place, and actually spending some time feeling sorry for yourself. Thank you so much for sharing this hour with me. I encourage you to write me at hello at expeditionself.com and share a bit about where you are right now in your life. Because in the fall, we're going to be inviting people onto the show to talk about their life and apply these concepts that I share each week on air live. So if you'd like to be one of my guests, I'd also like you to let me know about that too. I actually found a couple of poems. I'm going to read one and see if we still have time for the other. The first one is called The Way It Is by William Stafford. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing, and you have to explain about the thread. But it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. Isn't that cool? Okay, I have a little more time. I'll see if I can get this done. This is Sonnets to Orpheus, Part 2, 12. I don't think I said that right, but uh, that's my setup. Okay, ready? Here we go. Want the change. Be inspired by the flame where everything shines as it disappears. The artist, when sketching, loves nothing so much as the curve of the body as it turns away. What locks itself in sameness has congealed. Is it safer to be gray and numb? What turns hard becomes rigid and is easily shattered. Pour yourself out like a fountain. Flow into the knowledge of what you are seeking. Finishes often at the start and with ending begins. Every happiness is the child of a separation 
it did not think it could survive. And Daphne, becoming a laurel, dares you to become the wind. On that note, I wish you a wonderful week, and I will see you or, or connect with you through the airwaves next week. Thank you so much for sharing the time with me. Thank you.